everyone had opinions when it came to sequels. Generally, the initial movie produced the most impact, assuming it wasn't a pile of festering refuge in the first place. This wasn't always the case, however. The Godfather Part 2 sprung to mind, far better than its predecessor. But such sequels were rare and in the minority, and were simply riding the coattails and cashing in on the interest generated as a result of the success of the prior movie. Lindsay was veritably rubbing her hands with glee and practically demanding a bowl of popcorn as she assumed we, my parents Gwen, Peter and I, were about to embark on a conversation and discussion pertaining to the glamour and glitz of Hollywood movies. Alas, her exuberance was dashed, the popcorn not forthcoming. I placed an apple in her hand instead, and announced it was that time once again for real side dream recounting. The reason I had mentioned sequels was that the TV didn't have exclusive dominion over such things. Dreams were not necessarily a single demonstration, but sometimes a follow-up dream along the same theme could be experienced. Indeed, some real side dreams came in threes, and these were not only as an overemphasis on the significance of them, but to run as a sequence, a beginning, the main body of the demonstration, and the final part with accompanying music on occasion, as confirmation that the dream was concluded. And sometimes we had encounters, not always of the beneficial demonstrational variety either, with individuals we'd sooner rather not and which would star in multiple real-side scenarios. Characters like Bobby, I had mentioned on a previous evening. It wasn't Bobby who had returned, however. This was a new villainous individual, who had manifested twice, and several months separated his appearances, but I would retell the encounters and run them in a sequence, just like a movie and its sequel. The Stephen King novel called It, which recently has been remade into a movie, depicted a character a monstrous clown. That was a very close approximation of the individual who featured in this series of dreams. A twisted being indeed, the ability to affect and manipulate the dream arena and the inclination to bestow sufferings and adversity upon the unfortunates he came across, much like the clown in it. Protection seemed lacking, 
and my ability at the time of this encounter was insufficient to deal with him also, and thus my group and I had to suffer and be subjected to all manner of unsavoury experiences and attentions at the hands of this creature, the details of which I will not utter. It was not for the light-hearted, not family viewing, definitely hiding behind the sofa time, suffice is to say. It was pretty extreme. A short dream, yes, as I would then awake. Lindsay didn't feel it had the hallmarks of a great movie, and certainly Stephen King had little by way of competition here. But it was all in the experience, and what I gleaned from this was an opportunity to again be objective even in the face of severe scenarios. A chance to gauge my degree of awareness, even as I was being subjected to my torments, whereas were I lacking my awareness connection, it would surely have been a frightful, nail-biting, run for the hills, as long as there was nothing equally as malevolent in the hills, kind of encounter. So I wasn't traumatised, as well I may have been, even if I'd had this dream mere months prior to the event, and instead I shrugged it off, water from an elephant's back, as it were. And also it did highlight the undeniable fact that the astral level and creation was awash with all kinds of assorted beings of a twisted and creep-causing nature that lurked in the shadows and the recesses of the psych realms ready to strike and generally delight in the woes of others. Interesting in the sense that regardless of what is being regarded, be it movies, situations on the physical level, or encounters of this type on the real side, we always are the view. And what are all these experiences for? I left the question hanging in the air, a pause for emphasis, not a rhetorical question, it would seem. The responses were varied in their imaginative quality and absurdity, but the experience definitely wasn't for me to join a circus. Even with the reference I made to Stephen King's clown character, and no, it wasn't a dream that suggested I ought to lay off the Ronald McDonald hamburgers either. It was simply to become more aware to wake us up to something else, then we decide from there. We have many steps to go through while dealing with the personal self. Reactions are very important to experience, as we need to be prepared, so we can handle anything. The guides are preparing whomever is willing to accept these preparations to be able to deal with what is transpiring in this tumultuous world. The world presents itself in a particular way.
But scratch the surface, and the reality of it is something very different. It is far worse. We need to be able to make it through this life, and all of a sudden awaken, and no longer be pulled back or down by the effects of it. So, with all the nonsense and mayhem in this world, it's best to maintain a practice of being now, and view with your real awareness realistically, as opposed to allowing the mind to jump into the future and the past, which are just imagery and phenomena. Because things can suddenly happen, we may unexpectedly pass over and then not know what to do. The preparation for passing over is rarely considered, and we can get immersed in the process of reincarnation. We pass over, not know what to do, try grab another body and agreement to get back into this life, and return for more. So armed with the knowledge and the information, it surely should not be taken for granted. It is a long waking up process to where we are self-sufficient from the effects we have considered and agreed to for lifetimes. We carry these until we recognize we don't need these any more, but most hang on to them because it's all they know. But all these attachments are just phenomena. The world is agreeing to insanity, but it's played out as normality, even with the poison and radiation. An attitude of acceptance is adopted by the consciousness, but it's really controlled by the subconscious. So it's all in the preparation, so we can be okay, and not be trapped by the process we're in. Lindsay was wondering as to the point of another dream with this same individual, what possible experience or demonstration could be gleaned from such. But there were elements in it that were a little different from my first meeting with him, and no, I wasn't driving about in the astral with an exploding clown car, as Lindsay would now discover. So, this next dream, the sequel, I will dub Return of the Creepy Clown. I'm sure I could have conjured up a far better title. It rather lacked originality, but it was imperative. I impress upon everyone the creepiness of the character involved. And so the mention of the word creep was essential in the title. But I imagine people will already have formed that impression from the first recounted mention of him and his activities. I felt it prudent to remind everyone, lest memories be shorter than anticipated, for which I blame cell phones that this individual wasn't actually a clown, nor did he choose to don attire normally associated with them, at least in the previous encounter anyway. 
His attitude and general way of being resembled very closely that of the infamous Pennywise, the Stephen King clown of the book It. I would recognize this being immediately this second time around, not just through his general appearance, but the familiar way he chose to conduct himself. At least this time I was not the subject of his vile machinations and attentions. Other unfortunates were now suffering what I had experienced months previously. Perhaps even more so at that, for not only did he torture, maim, and molest these poor wretches, he was seemingly dispatching them when they failed to amuse him any further in all kinds of assorted and imaginative twisted ways. So I would observe, watching the scenes of gruesome carnage unfold before my detached, and maybe it would seem to some rather cold scrutiny. But this was my objective view, as I stood in my real awareness. My awareness would allow me to determine that this character was aware of my presence, and he recognized me as much as I did him, but seemed uninterested and disinclined to resume his attack on me from our prior meeting, what confirmed my suspicions that he was aware of me was that he even now, as I watched, seemed to be wearing a clown's suit, so he was equally as aware of how I had referred to him as a clown. It's a pity I hadn't compared him to a slug, but I doubt he would have assumed that form. Still, an opportunity missed, as he seemed keen to make me notice his noticing of me through his choice of guise I had associated him with. I would suggest the reason for why I was not his target this time was that my awareness had expanded to a greater degree than when last we met. I was able to stand more fully in it, and far more formidable, better able to handle situations and deal with such creepy individuals as a result. With the personal self kept at bay, the real self always knows what to do, and I sensed he knew this also, and possibly then considered a far wiser course of action was to leave me alone, and concentrate his malicious depraved attentions on those who posed no threat. A familiar story then, the bully who would only pick on those who would or could not retaliate. The analogy occurred as I was observing all of this, that of a computer game, where your character levels up, and monsters that at one time were very challenging, now could be smited with ease. My disinterested, detached observing would come to a conclusion, however. Seems he was goading me, raising the bar escalating and ramping up his activities to glean a reaction from me, 
as now he switched his focus to young children, and they were suffering the same abuse as the other individuals at his hands. It's conceivable that he was seeking my attention, trying to garner agreement, perhaps get me emotionally involved, and insert a tapline. In this regard, he may have succeeded, at least in getting my attention. I faded from the scene, and relocated elsewhere, in a garden with Peter, my father. I had made the decision to take this creepy clown out, to teach him the error of his ways, to inflict retaliation for all those who not only despised creeps in all their forms, but couldn't abide clowns, and thought them the most unfunny creations ever devised. I presented Peter with the opportunity to accompany me, the offer that he might partake of this adventure, if he so chose to accept the mission, and indeed he did. We would then spend a few moments practicing our real side skills, honing our abilities, fine-tuning our creation-manipulating capabilities. I was sharing with Peter some of my skills, from warping instantly from one location to the next, to hurling fireballs. It went well, besides nearly setting the garden on fire, and accidentally warping into a tree, and seeing double. It was a little like training before a fight, where boxers were in preparation for their opponents, getting the eye of the tiger, etc. Or perhaps like Star Wars, and the perfecting of the Jedi powers. Yoda would be so proud. Satisfied that we were as prepared as we were likely to be, it was time to locate the clown-wearing creep, and declare war on him. This may well be the last day of his creepy, orientated activities. Lindsay was rather disappointed. She was poised to hear the specifics of the battle. Would victory be ours? Would the clown be dispatched? A final tumultuous battle at the end of the universe, with exciting accompanying music. Perhaps with a but at the end, as the clown bounced off beyond our reach on spring-loaded boots, or on the back of a circus elephant. But alas, the final conflict was never to be experienced. Perhaps a third part would one day be had, and one less creep in creation the result. Lindsay commented now, how I could have at least given him a red nose to match his clown suit. An amusing thought indeed. It was interesting about the clown character it. For if we go back to some of Duane's works, in the dialogues contained in the new books, Rebazartars would refer to the Isnis as the It. Similar, perhaps, to how the controllers hijacked the reference that is the Is, by announcing the ISIS terrorist organization. 
The influence and the controllers here certainly delighted in playing on what is being presented with the new presentation. They attempt to install in the consciousness of humanity through their flagrant use of the references that the is or it is something scary, causing fear and trying to get people to hold on to what they have. And the clown was only wanting to deal with people who were unaware, because in fact he was afraid and didn't know what else to do. This statement didn't elicit much sympathy for our fearful clown creep, but nevertheless it was the case. The clown was afraid to step up and take the risk, and like others in creation, they have been bred with fear. But these people must one day step beyond their fears. Until individuals step up and do something real, boredom grips them and just look at the self-destructing world as a result. People proceed with their jobs and activities, which contribute to the demise, because they fail to take the risk and get beyond their fear. Life is big, and it can be daunting, but those individuals that project fear are usually the most afraid, and so they get others to become fearful. The only thing I was fearful of now was Lindsay eating all the apples. Just a pity things couldn't be so easily created as on the real side, or uncreated, as I frowned at Lindsay's cell phone. Rather curious how harm was perpetuated in creation. Some inflicted it directly, with glaring apparency. Others created technologies, with deadly radiations, and got everyone to agree to their usage. Perhaps all these mass murderers and psychos from the silver screen, and in real side creation alike, had missed a trick here. They'd be far more efficient and notorious if they simply became cell phone salesmen. Not only are they harming people, they are getting thanked and paid for it also. What a crazy creational matrix we dwelled within. I was humming the tune to Man on the Run, quite a catchy little stick in the mind melody which had the added effect of being exceedingly irritating to all who had to endure it. Always a bonus in my humble opinion, but there was another reason for it too. My real self was reminding me about another dream that had filtered through to my personal self by way of an appropriate song. A little hint then that this would be a good time to relay this particular experience. For in this dream I surely was a man on the run, so my terrible rendition of the song would cease. Much to everyone's relief, and I would transition to the dream in question. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say, I was a multitude of men on the run, 
as would be revealed. I was in a constant state of flux, altering my form, shape-shifting effectively. Nothing especially exciting about my shapes. I wasn't metamorphing into a werewolf or anything. Just a selection of human males, of different sizes, ages and appearances. So why was I doing this? Was it for entertainment purposes? Was I putting on a shape-shifting show? Could I not decide what form to adopt for my real-side philanderings? No, in fact, it was a defence mechanism. As I had entered the dream amidst, it would appear to be, a chase, and I was the hunted. My altering of form was my attempt to throw off my pursuers, a little like a wanted criminal, who will change their clothing constantly to conceal identity and evade capture. Unfortunately, the confusion I was trying to invoke was failing. My pursuers were relentless, and not to be curtailed. As far as I could ascertain, these individuals were human, but the distance I maintained from them made closer inspection and determining my assumptions to be accurate rather difficult. And considering they were all armed with guns, Keeping as great a distance between them and I seemed an outstanding act of prudence on my part. The chase had me running through worlds and scenes. Imagery and environments flashed by. I wonder how I may have looked to any bystanders. My motion and velocity was extreme. I may have appeared to any astonished onlookers like some kind of superhero, or maybe that cartoon roadrunner with my determined pursuers hot on my trail. The guns were not just for show or intimidatory persuasional purposes. They were more than willing to use them, and unloaded artillery upon me, blasting at me with their firearms. In the movies, the ones shooting at our heroes always seem to be the world's worst gunmen, the most feeble sharpshooters, hitting everything but the target intended. Seems on the real side, the gun-toting villains could actually aim. Maybe they ought train their movie counterparts, as I was taking regular hits. But I suppose, where the heroes of the silver screen were blessed with poor gunmen, I had the advantageous capacity to be unkillable. So I suppose it all evened out in the end. They were unable to drop me with their bullets, try as they might, and even though I ought to be resembling Swiss cheese by now. I ought extend the song Man on the Run to Man on the Run who is immune from bullets and runs like a whippet with dynamite attached to its tail. But I suppose that would be somewhat long-winded and less catchy. It became a little unsporting in my opinion. Despite my gun immunity, 
they were armed to the eyeballs, and here was I with no means to retaliate. It was time to even the playing field, add more fun to this adventure, get a little more James Bondy. I needed weapons of my own, but even Mr. Bond would be surprised by the means by which I acquired the weapons, as I manifested guns out of the very ethos. True, I'd never fired a gun in this lifetime, but the ability came naturally enough as I surrendered to my real self, putting the real me in the driving seat, assured that everything now would be taken care of, and so it was. In my real awareness now, I was as formidable and adept with a gun as though I'd been firing them all my life. I imagine my enemies suffered extreme levels of frustration as they were unable to take me down, but they were very much susceptible to my return fire. Although the quantity of them was never ending, guns depleted of bullets were not an issue as I simply manifested a new magical firearm. On hindsight, I should have perhaps brought forth a tank. Now that would have been fun. To add an extra element to the experience, I chose now to acquire my guns by an alternative means, instead of them simply appearing in my hands, James Bond would be proud again, as I would claim now my subsequent weapons for my attackers. I'd immobilise, disarm, and then be using their own guns on themselves. Talk about instant karma! This would continue on for a while. We must have run the length of the universe. But it was reaching its conclusion. The last form I chose for myself was that of an elderly gentleman with a sharp metallic suit to match his grey hair. I suppose the label gentleman wasn't especially apt, and don't be fooled by his aged appearance, for this form was very capable and formidable indeed, and my attackers were thrown hither and thither like rag dolls. I came across a selection of houses amidst overgrown foliage, and I dashed headlong in the direction of these, vaulting over the fences that obstructed my way. I was intending to break into one of these houses, defend it thus, and make my last stand. Then I awoke. Lindsay suggested it was another Dark Forces dream, the agents of Callum chasing me yet again, due to my waking up and waking up others. But there was an element of the dream then that was curious, the fact that despite my constant shifting of form, I was unable to throw off my pursuers. Either my guises were not very effective, and my pursuers were not then fooled or thwarted. Maybe I should have tried the whole werewolf thing after all. Or maybe I was recognised despite the guises I adopted. 
Lindsay suggested perhaps I should have popped into a phone booth or the car and changed clothing like Superman. And he did seem to be unrecognisable by simply putting on some glasses. I pondered if perhaps I was being chased by myself, and that explains why they were not to be fooled. Lindsay pulled a face. Why would I be chasing myself? Isn't that a little unproductive and odd? But it was more like my personal self, in protest of my becoming more aware, and it was demonstrating its opposition to this process. Created aspects of my consciousness, possibly thought forms, rumblings from the recesses of the subconscious, or some manifestation of my personal self, displaying its displeasure at an awareness journey that it felt would result in its neglect. For part of the process is getting through ourselves, demonstrated very clearly in this dream, the conflict with the created little self, and so the battle rages on as I go through my process. Lindsay wanted to know how I'd come across my shape-shifting skills, as it wasn't something generally taught in school. You would never have on the curriculum math class, followed by history lessons, and then turning into a bear practice. We've all been in various roles and positions. Invariably, we have spent time with the dark forces, and very likely picked up these kind of abilities and tricks. A little like a spy movie. The agent learns all of these things, then goes rogue, and defects to the other side, and the group he was initially affiliated with are after him, as he chooses to share their secrets with his new group, as an example. And because he was well known to the pursuers, his markings are easily identifiable, thus it's hard to evade them. And following on from this, the bullets then may not be what they seem. If this second possible viewpoint is followed through, the pursuers those after the defecting agent are firing ideas at the one they pursue, and he in turn returns fire with ideas of his own, which explained my invulnerability, for ideas surely cannot kill us. Unless someone suggested the idea of walking in front of a train or off a cliff, but nevertheless, you see what I'm trying to suggest. And it seems my ideas had greater effect, hence why they were dropped and I was not. Either way, really, but for sure. The personal self is hard to deal with. The personal self has its ideas, its wants, a constant back and forth, and tug of war. The personal self always tries to convince itself that eating that extra bag of sweets will be fine. It's always a case of trying to keep it in check, exemplified by the bullets firing back and forth. 
Lindsay felt that it would have been far easier to just eat the bag of sweets rather than have a shoot out all over creation. I suppose it would have been. The tiniest little things always are blown up so large for the experience purposes. The smallest little piece of awareness enhancing nugget of wisdom did seem to need such elaborate complexity in its delivery. But then it certainly made it far more fun. And who didn't like a chase, a gunfight, and to be virtually unstoppable on the real side, particularly when in one's real awareness? Lindsay muttered again about just eating the bag of sweets, then no universal gunfight was required. At least it wasn't a double hamburger, fries, and ice cream for dessert the personal self wanted. Who knows what that would have manifested as on the real side? Wishing to determine how dark it was, Lindsay would part the curtains. She had trouble announcing her findings. As the moment someone ventured a glance out of the windows, the dogs would assume someone was there, and ear splitting, headache inducing, barking would commence, followed swiftly by colourful expletives. When all was calm, returning to a state of relative tranquillity, with settled dogs, and every cuss word ever created exhausted, Lindsay conveyed to us all the news of how dark it indeed was. That jogged my recollection of another dream, or an experience to be precise, relating to the dark. Lindsay rolled her eyes. Seems every word uttered, expression ventured, and comment delivered reminded me of a dream or other. She was willing to wager that if she mentioned the potato the other day that had what seemed to be a very good likeness of a face on it, or that she'd dropped a rice pudding pot accidentally on her pet dog's face. I'd undoubtedly have a dream that these events prompted. It was true, I had quite the varied assortment of encounters and experiences, but none rice pudding related or even marginally involving Mr. Potato Head, or any other vegetable sporting a face for that matter. Besides a few old work colleagues, I hastened to add, I would proceed with my experience, and it was an encounter with an ominous darkness. I was dwelling in the place between sleep and wakefulness, in my room and maintaining this, just as a practice for being in my state of awareness generally. But more often than not, during such a state of being, I would encounter all kinds of things, mysterious, curious, and occasionally defying description. On this occasion, a great blackness began to seep into my presence. It flowed over everything, engulfing the room and all its contents. Not such a bad thing, considering 
as it concealed my unsightly pile of used underwear that had been accumulating in the corner. At first I wondered if the blackness was emanating from that. It would not have surprised me. This great void of darkness continued to flow and become overly thick in density. I have a wardrobe that very often is the source of phenomena and intrigue during my between states, and I have dubbed it my magic wardrobe. But now this inky blackness was filling the wardrobe too. It bulged and heaved with the pressure of this darkness threatening to burst and spill further this blackness into my room. I simply observed, maintaining my objective view, for to do otherwise, to bring emotion and thoughts to bear, would have me removed from this state of being due to disconnection from my real awareness, and I would no longer be able to witness this curious happening. A faint echo of consideration, not enough to end the experience, that this was perhaps something to do with the deep dark border. It had the void qualities that the border was said to possess, from those who had crossed it to reach the real universes. My awareness afforded me more accurate impressions, however, that this was something of a forbidding nature, some attack or other by the ever antagonistic dark forces, as the blackness continued to envelop my surroundings. Thus I unleashed the most effective defence, the new you song issued forth from my less than musical lips and the blackness visibly recoiled as though stung. It began to withdraw from the pure tones of the sound light reality of the all is. Either that or the hideousness of my singing. It receded and was no more. No trace of its dark invasion remained as though it never had been. So we can surmise, then, it was another attack, the dark forces making it quite plain how they detest those waking up and affecting the same controller defiance awakening in others. But everything in creation is also an experience, the nature of what we encounter is immaterial. It's simply the experience that allows the real awareness to blossom. If, that is, we maintain objectivity, so every experience does allow us then this opportunity to practice this way of viewing. All too easy for the personal self to interject, panic, run around in unproductive circles, and colour the experience with additional emotion and consideration. On reinspection, perhaps the dream was more a reminder of the great blackness enveloping all of creation, due to the agreed-upon demise, the constriction of awareness on a large scale, manifesting as blackness, 
that is, swallowing up the physical universe. Lindsay was impressed with the New You song, how it was able to deal with virtually any situation, from malignant individuals in our midst, to unsavoury situations, to encroaching darknesses. It's true, it wasn't just for the connection to the true light reality, it was in fact a cure-all. And no, it wouldn't rid Lindsay of annoying door salesmen. It certainly wouldn't cause pizzas to arrive on time for a change. And no, it wouldn't manifest buses when one was required. We went through quite the list of things that the new you song wouldn't actually do, and no, it wouldn't bring lightning bolts down upon work managers, but a delightful thought I must confess. I felt it prudent to remind Lindsay and all of the ever-present influence always seeking to garner our attentions. On the real side, it can be as simple as an idea, one that is not what it seems to be, but the real self recognises it and administers the appropriate warning and action. Lindsay was about to venture a few other possible scenarios that might the new you song possibly assist with, but this could be a conversation with no end in sight, and at times like these, maybe a great blackness obscuring everything from my presence, wasn't such a bad thing. I was able to halt her words, no easy feat that, becoming aware in the face of Dark Forces' opposition, a relative walk in the park in comparison. It was Peter's turn once again to speak of his real-side experiences and the pressing importance of the application of the New You song. In regards to pizzas, managers, and the door salesmen would simply have to wait. Lindsay looked at me expectantly, and I began to relate my latest dreams first one, I appeared to be in a huge open plan office area. Everywhere around me were people, a lot of them little more than kids, milling round and or at desks, loaded with files and papers and other office paraphernalia. It was a manic hive of industry. I was somewhere in the middle, where a middle-aged woman, who had apparently approached me to come in and help, explained that the wages bill was wrong somewhere and could I check it for her. She directed me to a desk and handed me a sheet of figures and a pencil. It all seemed a bit Dickensian although apparently in the present time. I sat down and started to check the figures but didn't get very far in the continuing pandemonium. I was soon asked by somebody to move to another nearby desk, and so it went on, interruption after interruption. Eventually the woman, who seemed to own the company, came back, and I started to apologise for the fact I had not got very far. But she brushed that aside and plonked down a huge mass of money on the desk, wads and wads of £20 notes tightly bundled up. She said that this was for me, and before I could protest, 
It was far too much. I'd hardly done anything. She turned on her heel and disappeared through the mass masses of people. I held up some of the wards in disbelief, wondering just how much was there. Then I noticed a letter sticking out from underneath them and saw the figure £160,000. Before I could read the letter, I was distracted and it disappeared. I piled the cash into my briefcase, run, wondering what to do with it. Something or somebody made me leave the desk momentarily and, surprise, surprise, on returning my briefcase was gone. I tried to find the woman without success, somewhat annoyed at my stupidity. Think of all the people I could have helped with that money. I then found myself going down some stairs in some sort of modern looking supermarket, followed by Gwen, Kevin and I believe your brother Gary. All of us carrying shopping bags or boxes of some sort. We reached a right turn in the stairs and there stood a nasty, bald, middle-aged man with a wailing, unpleasant child who immediately accused Kevin of banging the brat's head with a corner of the box he was carrying. We knew this wasn't true, so I ignored them and carried on down. That was about that, other than I felt myself thinking the money was probably insured anyway. When I then woke up, my first thought was money laundering. Then I realised it had all been a rather arduous dream. What did Dwayne have to say about all this then? Well, several things really. Um, the fact that uh, taking on the work for some reason was a willingness to do what was needed and and the mega amount of cash was apparently a reward for this um, and uh, and then the fact that going down the stairs uh, we were distracted or I was distracted my per which was my personal self um, and perhaps if I perhaps getting so distracted I forgot my intentions of where I was going but he, he Dwayne did underline the fact it was nothing to do with money laundering, not to worry about that. Um, and the, the fact that I was going down the stairs was also interesting because I thought it myself that it indicated a sort of backward step, but uh, in fact Dwayne said that all it meant was that I was originally on the real side in the dream and when I was going down another level to, the, I suppose, the physical side. Um, anyway, that was uh, that one really, but well, did you have any more dreams recently of any interest? Yeah, um, this one you might find of interest. Um, we seem to have hit on hard times in this dream that I'm about to tell you about. Uh, um, if only because we appeared to be living in a bus, a double decker. It appeared to be late afternoon, but for some reason I was in my pyjamas and I'd only just got up. Perhaps I'd been ill or something. Not something happens very often, I have to say. Gwen and I were on the top deck of the bus, and somebody came up to join us. He was a thick-set man of about 30, dressed in a dark grey suit. In his hand he held a very large, plain white card, like some enormous birthday card, with nothing on it, and having seemingly several pages. He handed it to me and simply said, This is for you. I opened it and, for some reason, expecting it to be about my great hero, Richard Wagner, was in fact surprised to find it was about me. Something caught my eye to do with numbers that were important to me, apparently. The one that jumped out at me in large black numbers was 330. 330. Then Gwen ushered the man to the front end of the bus, having first directed him to a veritable library of books at the back of the bus for him to select something to read, while I disappeared to get washed and changed. The last thing I saw was him sitting up the front end with his feet up on the window ledge, book in hand, 
I didn't get a chance to see what else was in the thing he had given me before I woke up. Dwayne's take on all this was that being on top of the bus suggested being up a level and being able to look down and see what was going on below. And the books themselves symbolised knowledge, which I suppose makes sense. I have suspected that the man who gave me the card was actually a guide, uh, which Dwayne said was probably the case, and that he was going over things and really just uh, showing me that I was on my way. Um, guides can't tell us what to do, but sort of, I suppose, point us in the right direction. Any more then to tell us? Yeah, one more. Uh, this time things must have been looking it up again, as we were once again seemed to be living in a house, albeit a small two-up, two-down one, like I had lived in with my parents and sister in Luton for the first 17 years of my life. Gwen and I, and I think maybe one of the offspring, or your brothers, were upstairs when we heard a noise downstairs. It was night time and we suspected an intruder had entered our domain. I got the short straw and was encouraged to go down and if necessary do battle with he who dared to breach the battlements of this Englishman's castle. Armed with a dangerous looking plastic kitchen spatula, feeling every bit like Peter Sellers in the film The Battle of the Sexes, where he reached behind to put a carving knife out of a kitchen drawer and found himself threatening his female adversary with an egg whisk or similar, I ventured apprehensively downstairs only to find nobody there. The scene changed abruptly and I was now apparently in a different though similar house at the foot of the stairs which puzzled I duly ascended. At the top were the now seemingly obligatory only two bedrooms. The one on the left seemed to be in total darkness, whereas the one on the right was lit up. There was nobody in either as far as I could see from the doorways. I now found myself in yet another house. I don't know how I knew they were all different ones, this time in the downstairs front room, which looked like it had been completely trashed by persons unknown the floor covered in wrecked furniture etc. On the walls were huge dark blue murals but I didn't see clearly what the pictures were of. In the next and final scene of this dream I found myself outside in the spacious front garden of a much bigger house. Pulled up at the curb was an old style black car probably from the 50s. It was a bit like a Ford Zephyr of the type one of the first British cars to have a long American style boot or trunk and had several gangster like men sitting in it. Two or three other would be James Cagney's stood around on the lawn. Then I noticed three women folk who apparently lived in the house and of varying ages. I saw with horror that all their eyes were covered with hardened cement seized with uncontrollable and for me totally untypical rage I looked around for a weapon and had to do with a house brick which I hurled at one of the car windows I woke up before it reached its goal feeling rather pathetic what did Dwayne have to say about all that then well the downstairs elements in the, in the story were to do with my personal self whereas I suppose moving upstairs was uh, more the real self. Um, I suggested myself that I thought the different houses might possibly re refer to different lifetimes or symbolise different lives, which uh, Dwayne said could well be the case. And Dwayne said that my getting upset was really my choice. He said we all, we all go through this, including himself. We can't help ourselves at times. And there's nothing to sort of really blame ourselves for but we need to uh, try and get the better of these things and basically look to see our real selves where, where we're I suppose above all this kind of violence and everything um, I think that's basically it really um, I was at the time 
little, not really. I'm not going to get up early tomorrow. We better, I'm going to have to call it a day, I think. Um, and with that, we close the session.